Hello, I'm Bob Challoner, the Chief Administrative Officer at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, and I'd like to welcome you to another edition of Focus on Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, your monthly program about the people, the services, and the events at your community hospital. We've started a number of new programs at our hospital in the last uh, couple of years, and the, the newest was just approved um, this past summer, which is an electrophysiology program. And to talk about it, we've invited Dr. Eric Roshbaugh, who is the director of the Heart Rhythm Center at Stony Brook Heart Institute, to talk about heart rhythm disorders. Dr. Roshbaugh brings uh, to our community, our hospital, and the entire region a tremendous amount of experience in uh, heart rhythm disorders. And he's also serving as the head of our new electrophysiology lab here at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital, where patients are being treated for arrhythmias or irregular heartbeats. And I'd like to just say welcome, Dr. Rashbon. Thank, Thank you for coming out and helping our hospital and our community with this. Um, and as always, I'd like to just talk to you a little bit about your, your background and how you've ended up out here on Long Island. So maybe just tell us about your training and, and the type of doctor that you are, the specialty that you're sure. involved in. Okay. Well, uh, I moved around a fair amount during my training. I did medical school at Yale and New Haven and uh, internal medicine in Rochester, New York, uh, cardiology and electrophysiology at Tufts in Boston. and. Uh, my first uh, job was at University of Maryland in Baltimore, where I was for seven years as an electrophysiologist. Right. Uh, and at that point, you know, I was doing uh, a lot of clinical uh, electrophysiology, uh, a lot of research, and I kind of felt ready to take on my own program. So I started looking around for a program to lead in electrophysiology. And okay. uh, Stony Brook was very appealing in that regard. There wasn't uh, really much. Uh, electrophysiology happening yet in Suffolk County in particular. A lot okay. of the cases were being referred in uh, to the city or to Nassau and a you know, large population of patients, uh, almost right. you know, one and a half million in Suffolk County. So it seemed like a great opportunity to build a program from the ground up and, and put my own imprint on it. So uh, it's worked out quite well. I've been here for 12 years. 12 years, wonderful. And I'm sure that uh, there's been some major changes in the, in the whole field itself. And can you just for people that may not understand, what does cardiac, uh, what is cardiac electrophysiology? So it's the treatment of abnormal heart rhythms. Okay. Uh, so uh, it can be anything from people with abnormally slow heart rhythms who need a pacemaker, uh, people who have uh, uh, serious, life-threatening, dangerous fast heart rhythms called ventricular tachycardia who need a defibrillator uh, to protect them against recurrences. Uh, we put defibrillators in prophylactically in people with poor heart muscle function. Uh, we also do a number of ablation procedures where we insert wires through the groin up to the heart and okay. cauterize abnormal heart tissue in order, order, excuse me, in order to cure heart arrhythmias. Okay. Um, so how, um, let's talk about heart rhythm disorders. Um, clearly we're all familiar with the, you know, the typical heartbeat and uh, um, so I'm assuming when we say rhythm disorders actually that the heart is really just not beating in sync or beating uh, in that usual pattern that you're, you're diagnosing? And Exactly. I mean, there's a range of different problems that can happen. Okay. Uh, so the some of the more common things that require a pacemaker or are just uh, the normal pacemaker of the heart and what's called the sinus node uh, that starts every heartbeat uh, just doesn't work well. It will just right. stop intermittently and uh, there'll be a pause in the heartbeat and people can pass out and injure themselves. So uh, placing a pacemaker fixes that. Uh, other people uh, can have a disorder called heart block where the cabling that connects the upper and lower chambers of the heart can stop working. Again, a reason for a pacemaker. Okay. Uh, and there can be any area within the heart that can also trigger a fast abnormal heart rhythm. So in the upper or lower chambers, and that can either be treated with ablation, drugs, or devices, depending on what's going on. So the upper and lower chambers are actually beating at different different rates? Uh, some... Ideally, no. Okay. Oh, all right, all right, but, <laughs> but they can. But uh, that's often when we're consulted and called upon to fix things, yeah. Okay. So let's, how, how do you diagnose? Uh, when do you, uh, what, what procedures do you go through to diagnose a uh, heart rhythm disorder? So if it's continuous, if someone's having it, you know, at the time that we're called in, a uh, simple EKG uh, electrocardiogram will show us what the precise problem is, but okay. uh, often people will have intermittent symptoms. They may feel dizzy or uh, feel palpitations, feel like their heart's racing and not know what it is. Okay. Um, in that situation, we have people wear a 30-day monitor 
uh, to try to pick it up. And if that's not successful, we can either in, uh, inject a device called a loop recorder uh, that has a battery that can last up to three years and uh, will automatically record any slow or fast heart rhythms. That's a device that's actually implanted somehow? It is, yeah. Okay. yeah it's like, uh, it's a two-minute procedure, actually. Uh, we just make a small nick in the skin under local, inject a little chip, and close it with surgical glue. Interesting. And it's, uh, is it attached to the heart, or it's just got a monitor that's... Uh, it's almost like a continuous EKG, so it's not attached to the heart. Okay. Uh, so the little device itself has electrodes on it that record, you know, the, the EKG almost from the body surface, except it's under the skin. Okay. Tell me for a layperson, I may be worried I've got a heart rhythm disorder or whatever, what would be some of the symptoms that I would look for? Uh, palpitations, uh, skip beats, racing heartbeats, okay. or uh, dizziness, blackout spells. So fainting is another thing we're commonly consulted for uh, to try to figure out if that's from an abnormal heart rhythm. Okay, and that fast heartbeat, that's something that's, uh, you know, when we exercise our heart tends to slow. How do we, what would you call a fast heartbeat, or what, was that, the, what does that feel like uh, for someone? So inappropriately fast, so okay. not when you're, when you're exercising it's normal for your heart rate to pick up, and in fact you won't feel well if it doesn't, um, and uh, some people actually get pacemakers for not having an appropriate heart rate response to exercise. Okay. So it's normal for it to pick up you know, as part of uh, exerting yourself, but say you're doing nothing, you're sitting around do, watching TV, and all of a sudden your heart goes at 160, 170 beats a minute, you know. Okay. Feel that and not feel well while it's happening. It's almost like that—the the car engine that, for some reason, just out of the blue, is just revving on its own. Sort of. Uh, yep. Something's probably wrong there. Sure. Um, are there any um, risk factors that that may cause this uh, the uh, the abnormal or uh, the, the the heart rhythm to really change? Sure. Um, it's just common conditions that a lot of people have. So as you get older, high blood pressure is one of the most common okay. medical problems that can cause scarring over time in the electrical system of the heart. Uh, it can cause uh, the heart chambers to dilate when they're working against a higher pressure load. And any time a chamber is stretched, it stresses the electrical system. Okay. Uh, and people who have coronary disease have a heart attack uh, that impairs the pump function of the heart muscle and you know those are the people we end up putting in defibrillators uh, preventably to try to protect them against uh, dangerous heart rhythms that may originate from the scar from the old heart attack. Okay. Are there different, uh, so heart attacks are a reason that would cause this, um, aging it sounds like a factor, other, other areas that would cause this disorder, or other reasons that cause these disorders? Um, so the most common arrhythmia is atrial fibrillation, and that's been related to high blood pressure, diabetes, aging. Uh, okay. Almost 10% of uh, seniors have atrial fibrillation, so it's a, a huge amount of patients. Um, uh, other things are uh, sometimes we see people with heart muscle problems who may have had uh, like a viral infection that affects the heart muscle, uh, so they don't have blockages in the arteries, but they're still the their heart's not contracting normally. Okay. Uh, so uh, that that may be the cause in those particular. Is that patients. viral infection something that can stay, or is that, or I mean, uh, persists, or is it something that typically would go away? Or so the viral infection does go away, but often it's the body's own response to fighting off the virus that also causes uh, causes the immune system to attack the heart as well. Okay. Uh, so. Uh, um, and that, you know, over time we, we can treat with uh, medications that we give, you know, just to strengthen heart muscle function, but not specifically like uh, medications to get rid of a virus per se. It's mainly uh, kind, okay. of, kind of the stress caused by the original infection. Okay, great. So you use the term atrial fibrillation, and I know we've, we hear that often. What is that exactly? So it's an irregular heart rhythm that comes from the left upper chamber of the heart. Okay. Uh, so in people with early on or early stages of atrial fibrillation, uh, the areas that drain blood from the lungs, uh, called the pulmonary veins, uh, right where they connect to the left upper chamber, the left atrium, those okay. areas can be electrically overactive and can fire abnormally and trigger atrial fibrillation. Okay. Um, so uh, it has a number of implications when patients are in atrial fibrillation, the upper chambers kind of quiver, they don't squeeze the blood out well, okay. so there's a risk of clots and stroke, so we have to assess whether they need blood thinners uh, in order to uh, prevent that complication. In terms of controlling symptoms, uh, we can either use antiarrhythmic medications to try to prevent episodes of uh, atrial fib, or increasingly we're doing ablation procedures for okay. this uh, because uh, there have been a number of studies comparing ablation and medication, and ablation seems 
seems to be a better option long term. Okay, so I understand why if the heart is um, beating irregularly and cause dizziness, fainting, um, but a rapid heartbeat or intermittent heartbeat, what are what are some of the complications that can arise from that? Why is why is that a concern, um, and what are some of those complications? So, I mean, with atrial fibrillation specifically, stroke we already mentioned is one of, it's one of the most common causes of stroke. Right. Often we see people uh, who are hospitalized without a previously recognized arrhythmia and. Uh, uh, you know, many of them, they can't determine why they have a stroke, and a relatively new thing that's come up is when we put those loop monitors that we discussed before right. in, about a third of those patients will find AFib that the patient just didn't feel, atrial really? fibrillation, and yeah. so that's, that's the cause of stroke. So, uh, okay. uh, atrial fibrillation, unlike other heart rhythms, sometimes patients are unaware of it. Uh, they don't feel palpitations all the time, so right. that's a particular problem when, you know, they you know, have a stroke and we don't know why. So, right. so that's an uh, a important uh, uh, new kind of strategy for figuring out and preventing uh, future events. Um, okay. Other problems that can happen, of, just apart from bothersome symptoms, if your heart is going too fast and it's, you know, just like that all the time, it's kind right. of uh, like wearing out a muscle. I mean, the pump function of the heart can be compromised over time just from beating too fast all okay. the time. So. And uh, if you get, if you control the arrhythmia, uh, you know the function can get back to normal. So okay. That's a and is that arrhythmia, uh, the atrial fibrillation, something that occurs in older people more often? You said, or it's a, so what it's are a, the risk factors? It is more common as you get older, uh, okay. but it can happen in younger patients. Um, so uh, it's mainly seniors that we see with it, but we also see people in their 40s, 50s with atrial fibrillation as well, okay. particularly when they have the other conditions we spoke about, like uh, overweight, diabetes, high blood pressure, those kinds of things. Okay. Uh, and it's actually a lot of new evidence now that, uh, I mean, in the past we've kind of just focused on the rhythm, you know, uh, give, right. a, give a drug or do an ablation to kind of fix the rhythm, but uh, there is evidence now that, I mean, there's so many overweight people in the U.S. now that if you uh, get people to exercise and lose weight, you actually reduce the amount of AFib and okay. increase their responsiveness to uh, treatments, whether they be ablation or actual medications. Okay. Um, why, so, do the, why do the clots form? What's uh, just, uh, I'm curious, the, 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 I know the concern is clots forming and then those are what trigger the stroke because the right. clots end up in other parts of the body and particularly the brain, but what, what's causing the clots to form? Uh, so normally the atrium contracts and squeezes the blood from the left, from the upper chamber, the left upper chamber to the left lower chamber. Uh, it helps with filling of the ventricle, right. but when it's fibrillating, and it's going 300 beats a minute. Basically, right. it's just kind of quivering, so it's not able to mount an effective contraction. Okay. And, and the flow is even lower in an area called the appendage. That's like a little sac that hangs off the left upper chamber of the heart where your blood flow is even less, okay. and that's where 90% of the clots form. So okay. uh, the prevention strategy is usually uh, uh, you know, blood thinner medications, but uh, an important, new, relatively new thing that for people who can't take blood thinners either because they're unsteady on their feet, they fall and hurt themselves, or they've had bleeding episodes. Uh, okay. We can do a device called, called the Watchman, which is like a little umbrella-like device that we can insert through the groin, kind of uh, and place it, pop it open right in that appendage to seal it off so that uh, clots can't go to the rest of the body. And uh, people need to be on blood thinners while that device heals in place for about six weeks, but right. after that they uh, just need to be on aspirin and similar medications. So it reduces the risk of bleeding and people can't take blood thinners. Fascinating. So the blood, the clots are, it almost sounds like because the blood is becoming like stagnant. And it's exactly. Just okay. Yeah. Um, Let's talk a little bit about electrophysiology, and it sounds like you've told me that this is, uh, this is an area where we're monitoring the rhythm of the heart, the pacing of the heart, um, and the uh, electrophysiology lab that we have, well, you have at Stony Brook, and you've extended now the services down to, uh, to Southampton Ho uh, Hospital. What are those, um, what are those services that you're doing both up at uh, Stony Brook University Hospital and here now at Stony Brook Southampton Hospital? Okay. So at uh, uh, Stony Brook University Hospital, uh, we do the full range of procedures. So, uh, um, you know, implanting devices as well as ablation procedures. Um, so ablations can be relatively uh, less complex if it's just a single pathway, if it's on the right side of the heart, uh, or if we need to 
cross over to the left side of the heart, right. and uh, that's a little more complex. In New York State, we can only do those in places with, that have a cardiac surgery program right. on site, so that right. includes ablation of atrial fibrillation. Uh, also, uh, removing uh, wires, leads uh, that have been in place for uh, years at a time. So uh, the reason why we might need to do that is if someone has an infected pacemaker or a bloodstream infection that involves the wires inside the heart, okay. the only way to cure that is to remove all the hardware, and right. uh, you have to use a laser to get those wires out, but uh, you, that has to also be done in an area with cardiac surgical Seems backup. Like incredibly complex technical work. Yeah, um, yeah I, would, I would think you'd need a lot of backup and a team behind you to do right. all of that. So. Yeah, those lead extractions we actually do in the operating room you know, with a surgeon on site for backup. Okay. Um, but what, what we're doing at Southampton is uh, focusing on the device implants, so okay. uh, pacemaker implants, defibrillator implants for prevention of sudden death, uh, and uh, you know patients who just need their devices replaced who are followed locally here, and it's it's a benefit to them to uh, be cared for locally for their uh, you know perhaps less complicated procedure. And uh, the hope is that we may be able to, you know, eventually offer those right-sided ablation procedures uh, if we're able to get additional equipment for the lab here at Southampton. Okay. And can I just back up a little bit just for people that are really um, not familiar with some of this terminology and technology? And it sounds like very simple questions to clinicians, but a pacemaker. Can you just describe exactly what a pacemaker is doing and when somebody's getting a pacemaker, what to expect? Sure. So the standard pacemaker... Uh, uh, what we do is uh, the, the patient will get sedation, an anesthesiologist is present to make them sleepy and comfortable. Right. We numb up the skin, we make a small incision under the collarbone, find the vein uh, under the collarbone and thread wires down through the shoulder veins to the heart okay. and attach them to a little battery that we place under the skin in a little pocket that we form. Okay. Uh, and those can be either one, two or three wire pacemakers depending on what the patient needs. Um, uh, so, I mean, that's the standard pacemaker. Uh, there is a newer device called the Micra, uh, a leadless pacemaker for people who just require pacing in one chamber of the heart, the right lower chamber. Um, we can actually put a device in through the groin that's a self-contained pacemaker, so it's a little cylinder with prongs at the end that we can attach directly to the heart and there's no wires that go back to anything under the skin. So does it have a battery built into it? Or it how? does, yeah. Really? Yeah, how well, long does that battery last? Anywhere eight to 10 years, depending on how much it's used and you know, what the pacing requirement is, so what the current train uh, that will be. That is amazing. How long have these devices been available? Uh, it's within the last couple of years, so two to three years. Okay. Um, and they've actually compared it to uh, you know the standard pacemakers and people who are appropriate for this device. And actually, complications long term are are less because uh, a lot of times people can have uh, discomfort related to the device pocket under the skin, um, or wires uh, can break over time if they're going under the collarbone. That's like a stress point where people are lifting or doing normal activity. You know, right. like, uh, we have to, we tell people who have a standard pacemaker they can't do heavy lifting on the side of the pacemaker because you know the, the device sits on top of the pec muscle but the wires go through it on the way to the vein so if you're really working that arm you can damage the insulation and okay. it, in the function of the device. Stretch so, the area. so with this one you don't have to worry about those things you know they can look in the mirror and they'd never know they'd have a pacemaker. Wow. So. Well, how do you monitor the battery length on it? I'm just a very layperson question, but how, sure. how do you know um, that the battery is still effective? So the follow-up is similar to what we do for standard pacemakers. So when we check a pacemaker in the office, uh, we just put a little programming head to communicate with the device uh, that's attached to a computer okay. uh, right over the pacemaker. So. Uh, in the case where the entire pacemaker is inside the heart, we just put it right over the heart and it picks it up and transmits the information. Wow. Um, and a defibrillating pacemaker, can you talk about what, what those are doing exactly? Sure. So pacemakers just treat slow heart rhythms, so it keeps the heart from going below a specified rate uh, so that people may, won't feel dizzy or tired if they can't get an adequate heart rate response on their own. Okay. Uh, what a defibrillator is doing, it, acts, it does everything a pacemaker does, so it can act as a pacemaker when needed. Uh, but uh, if someone is at risk for a dangerous heart rhythm, so if they've had a heart attack, they have a big scar in the heart that can trigger a rapid dangerous heart rhythm, uh, it can stop that. And sometimes that can be stopped by just pacing a little faster uh, than the regular heartbeat to try to stop it, and that's painless if that okay. works. The pacemaker actually speeds up a little bit? It will, that? yeah. Okay. So if, in order to interrupt the abnormal circuit, it'll speed it up a little and then stop pacing to see if that stops it. And that's 
It's called anti-tachycardia pacing. Uh, it's very effective, but if it doesn't work, the device will deliver an internal shock okay. in order to get it back to normal. If that happens, it hurts. I mean, the patient feels it, but it's stopping a dangerous situation. Absolutely, and that's the small version, I guess. We always see it on TV, the, the paddles on the right. person's chest. That's the kind of version of that in some ways? Or um, it's, not quite do as it's doing the same thing. Okay. Uh, the energy required is a lot less, so uh, uh, just for comparison, if you're using paddles in an emergency situation, usually you're giving 200 joules of energy. Okay. Uh, it's, the, it's usually 35 to 40 maximum with the internal device because the wire is inside the heart actually, so it's closer to where it needs to be to, in order to get the rhythm back to normal so you don't need as much energy. Okay. Um, and again, that's a device that can be implanted here uh, yes. at this point? With the so there's a, there are a number of different types of defibrillators. There are ones where we use primarily you know, shock only, so uh, people who don't really need the pacing part, even though they all can pace, it'll only kick in you know, if someone's heart rate gets very slow, like 40. Right. Um, but some people kind of have both needs, so there can be two wire devices that can pace the upper chamber of the heart, similar to a two wire pacemaker. Okay. Uh, and uh, there's also three wire devices called uh, cardiac resynchronization devices. So in people where the cabling uh, of the heart that connects the upper and lower chambers, there's really two main ones. It's called the left and the right bundle. If the left bundle is not working, the heart kind of beats out of sync, like the right side will squeeze, then the left instead of squeezing together. So okay. the blood kind of sloshes around and it can worsen congestive failure and breathing problems. So when we put three wires in and we can stimulate both lower chambers at once, it helps the heart coordinate, uh, beat in a more coordinated way and it can actually uh, help people feel better, reduce uh, shortness of breath and help the pump function of the heart get back more towards normal. When somebody's had one of these devices implanted, how quickly do they feel the benefit and, um, and what's the recovery period like? So it depends on what's going on. I mean, if someone's getting it preventively uh, right. for something that hasn't happened yet, they're not going to feel any benefit unless right. they actually, you know, end up getting shocked for the right reason. Right. So about a third of people within five years will get some sort of treatment from the defibrillator if they're getting it preventively. Okay. Uh, most of those will be just painless pacing treatment, but some right. people will get shocks. Okay. Uh, the three-wire device I was talking about, the resynchronization device, about three-fourths of people, if we pick the right people for the procedure uh, actually feel better usually within three to six months wow. uh, and I mean if someone's dizzy and not feeling well due to a slow heart rhythm the pacemaker will help them feel better right away okay yeah and in terms of post-operative pain it usually lasts you know unless there's complications like just a, a few days and then you know the wounds completely heal within two weeks Wow um, Tell me a little bit about the team that you use to, uh, that you work with and what's the process? A patient uh, comes to, has an issue and comes to the car, uh, walk me through what would happen with the actual the patient typically and who are, who's the team that you then would work with right. and how they're evaluated. Yeah, so uh, uh, we know a lot of the cardiologists and primary care physicians in the community, so usually right. the initial contact is they see something that they're not comfortable with or something's going on that seems like it might be a heart rhythm problem. So right. uh, they'll call me up and we'll get them scheduled in clinic. So uh, we always have uh, you know, one of our physicians meet in person with the patient before we even schedule any kind of procedure or anything just to kind of see what's going on, see what we think would be the best approach. And that may be nothing, it may be medication, or in some cases they may need a procedure. So okay. I mean, once we decide that that's actually what's ne necessary, um, uh, so sometimes we do some preoperative testing if it's not already completed, like an ultrasound or echocardiogram of the heart to study the heart function. But uh, a lot of times with, you know, if they're seeing one of the cardiologists we work with, they've had a lot of that work up already done. So if we're just going on to schedule something, they'll meet with our nurse practitioners or physician's assistants, uh, you know, just to kind of walk them through what to expect on the day of the procedure, okay. draw preoperative blood work, just explain the procedure again, even though we do that as well have them sign permission forms uh, and just uh, give them instructions for the procedure day. Uh, when they actually come in, they're going to meet that team again. So the physician's assistant or NP will, you know, greet them up in the pre-op area. They'll meet with the anesthesiologist and, and then uh, when everything's ready, go down for the procedure. Okay, great. And procedures typically, are they done under general anesthesia or they're... 
Most not, actually. Most okay. of them are light sedation. Okay. Uh, the loop recorders, uh, you know, the two-minute one I was talking about, the little chip under the skin, we just right. do local for that. So, uh, yeah. so there's no actual sedation, so people can just go home right afterwards okay. uh, and don't even necessarily need to not eat before. Um, so uh, the pacemaker and defibrillator implants, most of them are done under sedation. Uh, the relatively brief procedures. Um, so the three wire ones that I mentioned can take a little longer just because there's more wires to place and feel, where they need yeah. to go. Uh, but uh, you know, those are one to two hours. A standard defibrillator or pacemaker is usually less than an hour. So light sedation is usually enough to just help the patient rest comfortably during that. Go home that day or they typically stay overnight to be uh, observed or? It's for a new implant overnight. Okay. Uh, okay. Because we check the wire function and also the placement with x-rays, we want to make sure nothing changes in the early period after the implant. And then what sort of follow-up do you have to do with those patients? So we see them uh, one to two weeks afterward to check the wound. We want to just make sure that wound heals well initially um, and the, the device function is where we want it to be. In terms of long-term follow-up, uh, most devices is twice a year in the clinic, uh, but uh, remote monitoring of, de of devices has really taken off in recent years. Okay. So uh, Remote monitoring, just yeah. that. Yeah, so uh, patients will have a transmitter. A lot of the devices are wireless now, so if they have a transmitter that either has a cellular hookup or can hook up to their phone line, okay. uh, it will uh, send us a report at whatever schedule we tell it to. So. Uh, uh, and that can tell us a number of things. Some of the devices tell us about how much fluid overload a patient has and someone with poor heart function that can be important to catch things early before they have to be hospitalized for shortness of breath. Uh, and they'll also give us a look at just the function of the wires and the device in between visits so they don't have to come into the office as often. So. Uh, Wow, so literally, um, you know, you could be at home and being monitored without even realizing it. I right. Guess, uh, yeah. um, I mean, that's the easiest thing because yeah. it takes the compliance issue out of it for these wireless right. devices. We just plug in a schedule into the computer, and as long as they have the device hooked up and it's on a you know, cellular or landline hookup, it'll okay. just communicate when we tell it to and send us a report. And you have a team of people or something, I guess, in the back. Is there a monitor bank somewhere, sort of like NORAD? So each of, the, each of the company's uh, manufacturers have their own website uh, right. that the stuff goes to, and then we have, so there's four different manufacturers. We have to aggregate that, review it. Uh, we get alerts in terms of if there's something that needs immediate attention. Um, so it's, it's a fair amount of work. We have PAs that do that on the front end for us, and they review anything with us that needs more attention. And you'll literally call a patient at home potentially and say, hey, you've got something going on here, we need to see you? Happens every well, several times a week, I would say. Really? Yeah. It's amazing. I would think with somebody who's concerned, that would be an, a, a, a really an amazing advance also, just to know that you're being looked at like that. Right. I just have one last question. You've talked about a cardiac ablation, and we've heard that procedure. Um, just describe exactly what's going on there. Um, so the most common form of ablation is radiofrequency ablation. What that is is we place wires up to the heart. Some of them are just recording the heart signals to help us understand what kind of abnormal rhythm is happening. So we have to kind of record from multiple areas of the heart to figure out which area is triggering abnormally. Once we understand what's happening and if it's an area, we know where we have to go uh, to try to get rid of it. Uh, so we'll put what's called an ablation catheter, another wire up to the heart and uh, just navigate it, record where this, the origin of the arrhythmia is, and then cauterize it with radio frequency energy. So it's a little burn that eliminates the abnormal tissue without uh, affecting the rest of the heart. So it's a spotted tissue that's actually causing that, that abnormal yes. beating. Okay, wow. Uh, and in some people with atrial fibrillation, instead of doing uh, radio frequency ablation, so for atrial fibrillation, we talked about those veins that connect to the upper chamber of the heart. So the way we address that with radio frequency ablation, we do a circle of cauterization around the two left and the two right veins okay. to kind of prevent those impulses from triggering the rest of the heart. Okay. Uh, we can also use a freezing balloon. So instead of kind of making a circle from in a point, point, point fashion, we can use a balloon and actually freeze that whole circular area at once. And so that actually is a, a faster procedure that's more appropriate for some patients. Seems like a fascinating area right now, all of the advances, the technology, and certainly the skill set. And I would guess it's an area that there's a, an ever-increasing need as the, as the population's aging and so many of the baby boomers are sort of reaching an older age. Is that what you're seeing? 
Yeah, uh, I was. I mean, there's cycles like with anything, right. uh, but uh, it seems like uh, the need is on the upswing now. Right. Um, I think people are understanding just that atrial fibrillation, in particular, is the real growth area. It's just going to become more and more common, and as uh, ablation is gaining acceptance as a treatment earlier on, uh, right. you know, as we uh, are evaluating patients, uh, you know, we're going to need people to do them and places to do them. So, great. Well, Dr. Rashba, it's been fascinating listening to you and, and hearing what you're doing. And I, uh, on behalf of everybody in our local communities, we're so grateful to you and Stony Brook for bringing these procedures and, and helping our community hospital move forward here with this. So thank you for your, for your great work, and we look forward to seeing you often in the future. Yeah, so. well, thank you for having me, and you know, a lot of our patients are in this area, and so I know they appreciate having the service locally. Absolutely. So. That travel is a challenge, especially if somebody's not feeling too well, so having a local service is very, very important. Right. Um, I'd also like to uh, invite any of you that may have questions or would like some follow-up, you can certainly visit our website at southampton.stonybrookmedicine.edu or you can call the Stony Brook Heart Institute at 631-444-3278 um, where you'll find many people that are, that are eager to help you and, and if, if necessary get you in touch with Dr. Rashbaugh. I'd like to thank you all for watching our program today. I'd like to thank our friends at CTV, as always, for uh, producing the show and airing it in our Southampton communities, and our friends at LTV for airing it in our East Hampton communities. Um, as always, if you have any questions um, about anything we've talked about, need help navigating our health system here in the East End, or have any ideas for future programs or services, we welcome your phone calls and please feel free to call my office at 631-726-8555. Thank you everyone and good health.